You're listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Well, folks, welcome to another week of Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. And I'm very excited to be introducing you to a new friend and guest. And her name is Sharice. She is a survivor of satanic ritual abuse and other types of crimes that she has prevailed over to be talking to you today. And I'm telling you guys... Uh, I have not known Sharice for very long, but in the time that I have known her, her story has blown me away. Uh, she has such clear recollection of so many aspects of what she survived. And my goodness, do they, well, require us to stretch our minds as to what is really going on and what is possible. But she joins the choir of voices, uh, many of which that have been on this podcast, all saying the same thing. The world that we are told that we live in is not the world that we occupy. And there are forces of darkness at work that are doing and have continued to do for hundreds of years things that we have been taught are fantasy, not real, fake. Uh, many people have been called crazy because they have dared to testify to the things which they have survived. And, well, we're learning. We're not crazy. Um, Sharice, I am so grateful to have you here to talk with us today. Welcome to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Thank you, Dan. I'm happy to be here. Sharice, um, your story is incredible. I am... Um, I, I have been blown away by even the little bit that I've been able to get familiar with as we've gotten to know each other over, you know, really the past couple months. And, you know, folks, before she begins sharing her story, and we are going to start from the beginning. I am going to put out a trigger warning because of the nature of Sharice's story and the fact that she'll be speaking frankly to those things which she has overcome by the power of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you think you are very sensitive to um, certain information, you may want to listen with some caution. Um, but with that said, Sharice, I am going to just give you the floor. Would you please take us from the beginning into your story? Yes, Dan, thank you. I, I first of all want to um, say that that I give honor to my earthly parents. I do not know everything my parents went through in their lives to bring them to the places that they were. And so I don't ever want to do anything that is dishonoring. And above all, I give all the glory to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, because he is the one who has brought me through. But um, I, I do want to say from, from the start that Freemasonry um, had Freemasonry is a cult and um, it damages everyone that is in it and every family member associated with it. In the very first degree of Freemasonry, they they place a hoodwink over the initiates' heads and Thus, they become hoodwinked and they become deceived. And there is a veil of deception that descends on them because of Freemasonry. And um, there, there are many things that um, go on in the spiritual realm when there is a family involved in Freemasonry. And my family was. My father, my grandfather, my uncle. It, does something to the person's mind, it twists their mind so that what is wrong suddenly becomes right. And, and men can start doing things that would have been contrary to their nature had they not have been in Freemasonry. With that being said, um, my actual earliest memories are when I was in the womb. 
I know many people don't believe that that's possible, but our spirits are fully formed at the time of conception and they remember all things. And um, the Lord ha has gifted me um, with being a seer and with having the ability to, to remember much of these things. And so my earliest memories are, are in the womb. I had an identical twin sister. We were in, in the same sack. And, and there are many strange things that can go on in the womb that uh, people are not aware of. My, my twin and I each chose our own names. We had different names. And I am assuming our spirit to spirit connection, we were able to, to somehow convey that. Um, in, in the womb, we had dreams. I remember nightmares I had in the womb. So these children in the womb are very aware of what is going on and they have emotions. And um, I, I know many times there is an actual battle that rages in the womb. And if parents would start to get in the habit of teaching their unborn children how to seek God, that, that would be a great thing. Because um, I did not have those, those tools in the womb. But um, my twin sister and I, we were very, very connected. She, she was my, my light and my life. Uh, we would often uh, face each other with our palms out like this, and we would grasp each other's palms. Well, because my family was a cult family, um, I believe that my mother was subject to mind control programming, to hypnosis, and to drugging, because I remember several times in the womb where there would be very loud noises that would be directed at the womb. There would be flashes of light, and there would be much trauma to my mother, and my twin and I were very, very terrified. After some time, they started injecting me. I don't recall if they injected my twin or not, but there were large needles that had come through the womb and they were injecting it into us. I believe that they were trying to uh, somehow manipulate my bloodline. It was always about my bloodline and they were manipulating it. I believe some of the injections that they were giving me was actually someone else's DNA that they were trying to change and alter that. Well, after a while, when I was about four, four and a half months in the womb, my, my twin died. And I, I kept reaching for her and I kept putting my hands out, out for her. And I knew her spirit was gone because her, her light was gone. And I, I was completely overwhelmed at that point, still within the womb. I was in unbearable sorrow and the enemy took advantage of that. And evil spirits came in to torment me in the womb, the spirit of death, and an evil spirit called Pan, he was black with uh, black horns. And I had turned away from my twin and I was facing away from her. And occasionally she would kind of float over and bump into me. And that upset me so much. Well, this evil spirit Pan, would come and lay next to me and he would run his finger up and down my spine. And he would tell me that um, I'm gonna die, that they're coming after me and as soon as I fall asleep, I'm gonna die. And he was tormenting me. And I remember at one time, Jesus actually came into the womb 
after my twin died. And he turned to me. I saw the light. I turned and I looked at the light. He knew even in the womb, I didn't like to be touched. I didn't, I didn't feel safe being touched. But I looked at him and his hands were like this. And so I grabbed onto his hands. And he assured me in the womb that, that my twin was safe and she was in heaven and it was going to be okay. Now, I, I had a choice in the womb whether or not I could just completely trust my Lord and Savior and believe everything he said, or I could believe the lies that the spirit of death and the spirit of Pan were telling me, and I chose to believe the lies. Um, and so I was, I was completely, completely overwhelmed. Um, it was, it was like being in a tomb because as I, as I grew, I couldn't get away from the body of my sister. She was always there. And, um, it was, it was very, very traumatic. And I was, I was born, um, six weeks early. Me and all of my sisters were uh, born one to two months early, but um, after I was born, um, my parents were told that there was something wrong with me. I am assuming it is because of whatever injections they were injecting me with in the womb, but my parents were told that um, I was born completely without an immune system, and I would have to be kept in an isolation chamber my entire life. I, I believe I did have some type of troubles from all of the injections I had, but I believe that that was actually a lie to get me connected with other cult doctors so they could continue to experiment on me because my family was told that I would have to receive injections of immunoglobulins every week just in order to survive. And lo and behold, um, a nurse lived next door who claimed she could give me these weekly injections for years. And so I would go over there and I don't actually know what it was they were injecting me with. It was supposed to be some type of immunoglobulins. But um, as I grew older and I was able to walk, my mom would stand in the yard and she would watch me walk over to the neighbors and they would take me in. Well, the neighbor lady who, who claimed to be a nurse had a husband who also claimed to be a doctor. And when they had me alone, the doctor would start taking me into the back room and he would start giving me multiple injections injections in, in my thighs, and then he would start giving me IVs of some sort. And um, I, I started passing out regularly. In fact, one time after my injections, I passed out and I quit breathing and my jaw was locked, and my dad had to give me CPR. So I, I don't know what all they were injecting me with, but at one time I would have up to five different injections. And he always made me promise that I would never tell anyone what he was doing. And he would take me to another room where he had the old reel to reel films. And he would show me films of, new, of um, Nazis exterminating Jews. They were very graphic. The Jews were being dismembered and tortured and exterminated. And so it is my belief that this doctor was um, of a German descent and he was somehow connected to, to Joseph Mengele. And he would tell me that um, everything that they did to those Jews, he was going to do to me if I told anybody. And sometimes he would show me slides, he would have a slide projector, and all of the slides were of 
people being murdered very, very graphically. And then after he would give me all the shots, he would give me a slide to take home as, as a reminder. And I, I started passing out more and more. Um, and it was, it, it was quite, quite horrendous. How old were you at this point? Well, um, it was between the ages of two and six. When I was younger, um, I would say ages between four and two, my mother or, or one of my sisters would carry me next door for the injections. So that, that went on for about four years. And the combination of whatever it was he was injecting me with not only caused me to regularly black out, but it also stained my teeth black. My baby teeth were actually black. And then when my adult teeth came in, they were gold, golden and gray. And it was quite, quite disturbing. My father would often tell me um, that it was so disturbing to look at. He couldn't stand to look at me. I was not allowed to smile or to speak in his presence because he was so ashamed of me because he, he valued physical beauty above all else. And I had three older sisters and they were all, all beautiful. My father um, also used to tell me um, that he knew I wasn't his child um, and that he should have killed me when he had the chance. I was the youngest of four girls and when my sisters would go off to school my my father would turn on me and um he he would completely change and tell me that he was going to kill me he would put my fingers in hedge clipper, clippers multiple times telling me he was going to cut off all my fingers um he wanted strict obedience we had to obey everything he said without, without questioning it. We couldn't get in trouble. If, if anything didn't, didn't go right, we were, we were severely punished. He would, um, he would take me and all my sisters to his closet where he held all of his belts in there. And he would make us uh, choose which belt we wanted beat with that day. So by us choosing, it was as though we were giving our consent. And um, he, would, he would often beat us until um, we were blistered and bruised. We, we never knew why, why we were being hurt by him. Um, I, I know when I was about two, and I was still wearing a diaper at night, and I was threatened uh, never to ever soil my diaper at night. Well, uh, one day I, I was sick in the night and I had, had soiled my diaper. And the absolute fear and terror, I, I ran to my parents' bathroom, they weren't in there, and I tried flushing it down the toilet. And of course the toilet overflowed and there was water all over the floor. And I was stripped naked and forced to stay in the bathtub naked until my father got home. And he saw the water on the bathroom floor and he held my face in the water until, until I passed out. And so these, these kind of things were not uncommon. And then when I was two, I remember very clearly the first time that that my father sold me he he came in and he got me out of my bed at the age of 2 i strongly believe that at that point he he would drug my mother and perhaps even my older sisters because i would hear him tell my mother don't worry about taking care of the children this night you've been working hard enough i'm going to stay up and take care of them that's always a very bad sign and so I, 
I believe, I believe they were drugged. I know the first time I was sold, I was two. He picked me up out of the crib and I woke up to the cool night air as we were walking down our street. My dad was wearing his house coat. I was wearing pajamas. I couldn't understand what was going on. There was only one house uh, within a block from us that my mother warned us never, never to go to because a very evil man lived there. And so we always avoided that house and actually walked on the other side of the, of the street. Well, that, that was the house he, he took me to. He knocked very softly on the door. Um, the man opened the door and tried to take me. I was holding on to my father's neck so tightly in absolute terror that my father bent my fingers back and he handed me to the man and he walked off. And, and the man instantly, um, he, he would take me to his bathroom, strip me naked, fill the tub with cold water and hold my face under the water. And I would gasp and cry. He, he'd bring up my face, hold it under the water again. He would do that maybe 20 times. And he would say, are you going to obey me? And I would shake my head, yes. Are you going to do everything I tell you to do? And I, I would shake my head, yes. He would take me to his bedroom. I remember he had old polyester bedspread that had these dark flowers on it. He had nightstands and he, he would place me on the bed and he had a, a tripod with an old, old fashioned camera on it. And there was a wire going to it so that he could, he, he could take kind of remote control pictures, I guess. And so he would torture me. He would often use uh, pipes and um, other things that he would insert into me. And the more I would cry out and scream, the uh, more it, it delighted him. And he actually filmed every, every act he did to me of rape, of molestation, of torture. And um, when he was finished, I would be taken back to the bathtub because I was often often covered with blood. The water was always very cold and he would repeat holding my head under uh, until I was coming to the point of drowning. And he, he would pull it up and he would say, are you going to tell anybody? And I would shake my head no. So then pretty soon <clears throat> after a couple of hours or so, there'd be a quiet knock at the door. My dad would be there would be handed back to my dad soaking wet and the man would hand my dad an envelope of cash and so my dad would walk me back to the house I would be in absolute terror and in order to get around having to explain to my mother how I went to bed dry and woke up soaking wet my father would um, take me to the bathtub he would run a couple inches of cold water in the bathtub and seal it and put me in the bathtub and tell me I had to sleep there all night. And in the morning, my father would um, come in and he would call my mom and he would say, she must be walking in her sleep. Look what she did in the night. And I, I would have been shivering in this bathtub all night. Uh, my mother would uh, take me out and literally beat me for, um, for doing anything like that. Well, this uh, went on for about four years, and I was regularly taken over there, and each time I was brought back and placed in the bathtub. When I got a little older, I would sneak out of the bathtub when everybody fell asleep, and I would get my pillow and my blanket to to bring me some level of comfort. My sisters and my mother used to ask me why I would sleep in the bathtub. I couldn't, couldn't give them an explanation. But um, <clears throat> another thing that this man did is that sometimes when I would go over there, he would have other men there because he 
was selling me to other men. And there would be as many as three men there. And I remember one case in particular, there were, there were two men and they had brought their young son. He, he looked like he was maybe early teens. And, and he, he didn't want to harm me, but they forced him to. And so many times it was more than, than just this man doing that. And so I grew to um, greatly fear any type of noises in the night. And I, I would listen at night for, for footsteps. I would listen at night for noises and I would try to determine if the noises were safe or if they were dangerous. And many times I couldn't tell because my dad would tiptoe in, into my room to um, take me. There are still sometimes, even now, I will wake up and I will hear footsteps. Um, and then um, about that same time also, um, while we were in my grandfather's care, we were introduced to the Masonic Lodge. My grandfather would take me and um, two of my sisters. And just for the record, um, how old were you when you went into your grandfather's care? Well, I, um, we, we would only be in his care temporarily if my parents had something to do. Um, I, I remember being in his care when I was one. Mm. And and I believe it was just to watch us for a day or two while, while my parents did something else. And I'm not sure where my oldest sister was, if she was with my parents or not. But um, I remember me and, and two of my sisters. I was one. My other sister was three. My other sister was five. And they took us to the Masonic Lodge in a little room with black and white tiles on the floor. It was very cold. They um, laid me and my sisters out on the floor. It was all done very methodically. They, they had my oldest sister on the end and she, she was laying face down on her stomach. My sister who was three was in the middle and they put her face up. I was on the end, I was one, I was still in diapers. I was face down. When three men dressed in black robes and black hoods came into the Masonic Lodge and they did a group rape and assault of us. And there's something about three-year-old children that they are especially cruel to. At the age of three, they they do much more harm to them and um, even though it was absolutely unbearable and horrific at that age i i still have this memory of my dear sister um my three-year-old sister who was being absolutely tortured and tormented and her screaming <sighs> And they would always clean us up. Many times it was a woman who would come in and who would clean us up. And they would tell us, I guess it was a type of mind control programming. They would program us with the story we were going to tell our parents about what had happened. We would be cleaned up to a certain extent. We would always be given a coloring picture of, of Jesus or some Bible scene for, for us to take home. Um, I, I also remember uh, at the age of two, two of my sisters and I were taken back to the Masonic Lodge, and this is the first actual real mind control programming I can recall. So I remember I was I was two, so, so my other sisters were each two years older. And, and they had taken us to the lodge because 
we were going to hear Bible stories. Well, who wouldn't want their children to hear Bible stories? So they took us, and there were about six other children, big room, and they locked the door. And they um, grabbed me around the waist. They stripped off all my clothes. They took me to a small room that had no windows, but it had a large fish tank on the counter that was full of live mice. They took me at the age of two and they shoved me down in the live mice. Instantly, they were clawing me, scratching me. I was crying. I was reaching up my hands. I was slapped and I was forced down hard onto the mice. They would squeal, they would climb all over me and scratch me. And that's when they started doing the mind control program of Hickory Dickory Dock. And they would repeat it again and again and again. And they kept saying the words tick tock. Those were my cue words to go into a hypnotic state. But um, I, I would be in this tank, and they would come over to me, and if I would stand up, if I would cry, I would be slapped and pushed back down. And they kept asking me, what time is it? And I, I didn't have any comprehension of time. I was only two, and I didn't know. I'd be slapped for not knowing what time it was. And... They kept repeating the nursery rhyme. They would, ha they would have me repeat it and say, what time is it? A man kept coming in, a mason. He would grab a hold of my face and squeeze it, and he was looking at my eyes. And if he said I wasn't ready, I was put back in. Something happens to a child when the Trauma causes them to dissociate and break apart, and you can see it in their eyes. And that's what he was looking for. So the man and the woman that had been torturing me left me in the, in the mouse tank full of mice, and they told me I was not allowed to leave. And so I sat there crying, and I noticed a movement in, in the shadows I hadn't noticed before. And I saw a man standing in the shadows up against the wall and I thought I don't know who this is but I'm going to beg him to to get me out of here so I stood up and I held my hands out to him he stepped into the light and it was my father and I I was begging him and he said no and at at that point I believe I started shattering because shortly after that the man and the woman came back in, the man grabbed my face, looked into my eyes, and he said, she split. So I had divided. After that, they um, picked me up by the waist naked. They took me out into a hallway in the Masonic Lodge. On the left, there was a door open. And there was a very large room. It had much higher ceilings than any of the other rooms. And there were six or eight what looked like bird cages hanging from very high up in the ceiling with children in them. My sister, who was terrified of heights, she was closest to the door, and I saw her in one of those bird cages, and she was sobbing. And she was begging anybody to save her. And they would swing the cage violently. It was on chains. My sister would hang on to the bottom of the cage and cry. And I walked by and I couldn't do anything. My other sister was taken into an all blue room. The walls, the ceiling, the floor is painted blue. The table is blue. The chairs are blue given blue colors and you are programmed with the color blue. They, they took me to another room. It had a round stainless steel table that actually rotated. They had put a black cloth over this table and they, and they laid me on top of it and they started spinning it violently. They 
I had a strobe light and they would shine it in my face. And then they had another light above me that was a spiral and it, the spiral actually moved. I've never seen another light like it before. And they would move it one direction and it was mostly in a, in a um, counterclockwise direction. And then they would bring in um, a beautiful white rabbit and they would hold it over me and slit its throat over me so that the blood went over me and then, and then they would immediately lay it next to my body so I could feel it kicking into my body. And then they would spin me and spin me and spin me. And um, um, I, I, I started vomiting and passing out. They put um, pills under my tongue. I believe it was LSD because I started seeing colors and really strange things I, I'd never seen, seen before. Um, at, at home, my uh, dad started reinforcing some of my mind control programming. And whenever he wanted to discipline me or to cause me terror, he would take me over to the grandfather clock and he would point to it and he would say tick tock. And I would split and I would be in absolute terror and I would do, I would do whatever he said. Um, when I was a little bit older, um, they took us back to the Masonic Lodge. And I remember there were um, elaborate stage props set up, elaborate scenes, and they told us we were going to get to watch a skit. And so all of us would, would sit on the floor, and my two sisters were there also. And we would sit on the floor, and this man would come out dressed like Jesus, and he would bring out a man in a wheelchair, and the claimed he, he could walk and Jesus would go over and heal him, pull him up out of the wheelchair and all of his little girls would just clap and clap. We were so excited. And they told us that this was the real Jesus and he had come, come to see us and we were beyond excitement. We just loved him so much. We were just, just clapping, clapping for him. So then he, he would come out to where all the children were sitting and he would pull up his robe and he was naked and we couldn't even comprehend what, what we were saying. He started raping each and every one of us, forcing us to do sex acts upon him. And he said, this is what the real Jesus does. If you ever come to the real Jesus, this is what he's like. And then he would force us to sing to him the words, Jesus loves me. It is because we are weak and he is strong. And that was emphasized. To this day, when that song is sung, I usually have to run out of the room, but that, that went on uh, and it was quite horrific. And they told us never to go to the real Jesus because this is what this this is what he would do. After that, uh, one of my sisters, the one that was closest in age to me, we were taken to another back room, all in the Masonic Lodge. They made all of us change into these um, dirty, kind of rough woven tan uh, dresses that were covered in stains. And we all sat and we watched a film. And the film was another horrific film of Nazis killing, dismembering, murdering Jews in front of us. And the women and the children in the film were dressed in the exact same outfits we were. And then they told us that if we didn't hide, that the Nazis were going to come in and they were going to kill us. And so men dressed like Nazis came in. We were in absolute terror. I think there was probably about eight small children in this room and there were many cupboards and shelves. And my older sister was very, very protective of me. 
and she um, grabbed my hand and we ran to a cupboard and opened it up, but there were already two children hiding there. My sister crawled in and she tried to pull me in, but it was too late, the Nazi soldiers were coming. So I curled up in a ball on a shelf right next to the cupboard, always trying to make myself as small as possible so that they couldn't see me. They saw me and, and they pulled me out and they started hitting me. They had a gun and they were threatening to shoot me in the head. My older sister, who was just two years older than I was, she was actually watching through the crack in the cupboard. Mm. Still has dreams this, this day. She still has nightmares of looking through a crack in a cupboard and seeing his legs walk by. But anyway, um, as they grabbed me and they were threatening to uh, shoot me, my dear sister jumped out of the cupboard and said, leave her alone. And they took her and threw her on the ground. And with their boot, they stomped on her stomach as hard as they could. And she um, vomited and she was in pain. And they ended up walking away. And I was there with my sister on her side try touching her and she says please don't don't touch me nobody touch me so so those were some of our earliest memories at the Masonic lodge going from one station to the next to the next to the next all of my future trauma for many many years had its roots in freemasonry it was it was people connected to Freemasonry in some way or form. Um, I, I remember uh, at the age of three, my life was so terrible and I saw no hope that I literally tried drowning myself in the toilet bowl. And I was trying to breathe in the water, but I, I kept gagging and I was unsuccessful. I remember two years later, we had, we had a pool outside. I remember two years later, trying so hard to end my life in the pool because at that point, my life was such terror. I, I couldn't go on, except I, <laughs> I kept holding my breath and sticking my face in the pool, thinking I was going to accomplish something. And, it never did, and um, I was I was unsuccessful in in doing that. But um, after all of those things happened, um, you're doing good. You're doing a great job, Sharice. Really, truly, of the fact that I am actually not asking you any questions is because you're you're just telling your story. Well, we we uh, ended up moving to to a different state. Hmm. And my father um, had only been through 3 degrees of freemasonry. That was enough to cause a twisting in his brain, but when people leave Freemasonry, the Lodge doesn't let you leave and the Lodge doesn't let you forget. And all of the curses that you spoke on yourself and your generations stand until those are broken. And so after, after we had moved to a different state, the Masons in that state contacted my father. And I believe it was retribution for him leaving, leaving the lodge so early because his father had actually gone quite high within the Masonic Lodge. And they had wanted control of me. Now, I had three older sisters. I couldn't understand why it was just me and not all of my sisters. But they told my dad if he would sell me to them for $10,000, um, 
that they would train me to teach me to be obedient. And my dad was very big on us being obedient. And so the transaction was made and I was sold to the lodge. And um, every, every Wednesday morning, I had to be awake, awake at 1.26 a.m. starting from the time I was about six years old. My, my dad had started coming and waking up, waking me up 1.26 Wednesday morning because I had to be out at the street at 1.30 a.m. and a car was going to come and get me. Now, the very first few times that it happened, the Masons actually came, snuck into my home at night with their hands over my mouth took me. I thought I was being kidnapped. And when I got older, my father would start carrying me out to the car. I started crying, so he started dragging me. When I got even older, I was hypnotized. I had to wake up at 1.26 a.m. or I would be killed or somebody else would be killed. So I, I started being taken for about two hours. Every Wednesday morning, they would often take me to the basement of the courthouse, to the basement of the hospital, to someone's house, or, or to out in the woods. And that's when I, I first started seeing actual rituals being performed. And um, they would start with old men, I guess, if you will, bums on the street, maybe homeless people. And they would bring them in and they would drug them and they would give them all the alcohol that they wanted. And then I, I, I won't go in, into graphic detail, but they were always tied up. Their arms and legs were tied up. And they were always killed. In, um, in a very painful and gruesome way. And um, they would threaten to uh, do that to all of us if, if we did anything. Um, I would see where they would even bury the bodies um, under fire pits in, in, in the woods. Mm -hmm. Fire pits were small and round and they were dumb. They would use uh, sledgehammers to make the bodies as small as possible and put them in the fire pits and then put the fire back on top so that, so that nobody would, would think of looking. Um, everyone that I have known that has been associated with the cult has also been associated with either a, a mortician or a crematory of some, some type. But it was, it was during this time that um, I started stealing children because they would bring out children and they would bring out babies. They would have a lot of small children that they would start impregnating very, very early. Um, I, I believe the children were given some type of medication to cause them to be impregnated early. Mm. And, um, and, and, and how early are we talking here? Well, for, for me personally, my earliest pregnancy was when I was 10. So basically as soon as the menstruation starts, they start. No, it was it was before the menstruation starts. I know I know of some of some ladies that had actually started giving birth at the age of eight because they were given not only medication to cause them to conceive early, but medication to cause them to conceive multiples. I've resisted uh, saying anything all this time because your story you you just doing an incredible job and I have not wanted to break your flow, but you know, on saying that I will say that some things that have been reported to me by others 
that will go, you know, unnamed at this point, um, would include impregnation at ages that seem, you know, from a traditional standpoint to be impossible. Yes. And uh, they have or had some kind of way of making that happen because people are not making this up. No. But you have eyewitness, I mean, and, and memories to back this up. And you saw it with your own eyes, them making these girls pregnant before they even got their periods. Yes. yes. My gosh. Please continue. Okay. They, they have technology, they have laboratories, they have medications that, that the average doctors do not possess. Um, I, I imagine that they are receiving information and wisdom on how to build these things and how to do these things through demonic channels. But um, it's quite sad that they are so much far are far advanced than what the average doctor is here. But um, I would, um, they, they, they would take, take babies and small children, and these were all people that were connected with the Masonic Lodge in some way. A lot of them were close family friends that we trusted. Um, I know there was a policeman in, in this group because some of the bodies were placed in automobile accidents to make it look like they died in automobile accidents. I know my own elementary school principal was, was in this cult. There were teachers, many doctors and nurses. So it's not like somebody can just you know, go out to even the police station and say, this is what's going on. And, and I know in one of the groups, there was a wife of a judge. So um, um, there, there was no one safe. Mm. No one safe, you could tell. But um, I, I remember um, specifically, I, I had originally thought that there were 23 babies that I had stolen and that I had tried to save. Um, the Lord actually recently showed me that there were actually 67 babies. Um, most, I, I believe most of the children and babies that I actually stole were, were already gone at the time because they were, they were always taken, at least for me, between five and six months. I was never allowed to, to ever go past six months. I had to hide the pregnancy. So, so they were always taken early. They actually had me on a January, July schedule to where I would have a baby in January. I would have a baby in July. It, it didn't always, always work that way, but they, they tried to have me on a schedule. I, I have remembered 13 children of my own that um, they had taken from me. But these, these other children, um, if they were taken early from a child that was being sex trafficked, they were often left laying in the dirt and they would kill them and do other things with them. And so, um, as soon as I would find these babies, I would take off running with them. Now, now, granted, I was in the middle of a very dense forest. I would have been hypnotized and drugged in order to get there, so I wasn't sure which way to run. I always knew if I could get to a river or water and follow it upstream or downstream, it, it would lead me somewhere. And, and uh, I, all of my life, I've had nightmares of running with children, of hiding children. I could never understand that until, until I started having memories. And uh, I, I know on one occasion there was a little boy. Um, he was probably about eight or nine months old. And I, I grabbed him and I ran with him. And I turned upstream and I was 
I was trying in, in my young mind, because granted, I was only eight years old when I started doing this. So in my young mind, I was thinking if I can find a, a clump of bushes or something that is hidden to keep them safe, somebody will come and find them. And the cult um, always caught us. And then for years and years, I would have nightmares. I would actually wake up screaming multiple times every night my entire life. And I would have nightmares uh, of holding on to a child above the water. And they had hypnotized me um, so that I wouldn't run. And they told me that there were actually alligators and snakes in the water. And we didn't have those where I lived. But in my dreams, there were always alligators and snakes trying to get these children, and I was trying to save them, and I was completely panicked. And um, I, I know um, a couple years after that, I saw another baby that still had her umbilical cord attached to her. She was taken early because she was kind of sprawled out like a frog. And I saw her, and I... I knew I couldn't let her die. And so I, I looked and I saw all of the group around the fire. They would do horrific acts around the fire with all of the children present. But I was back a little ways and so I grabbed the child and I went in. And I was holding her close to me, trying to keep her warm. And, that's when I realized that I was completely naked. And I ran as fast as I could. And every time a branch or something would, would reach out and grab my leg, in my mind, I imagined it was my captors who, who were hiding, waiting to grab me and, and to kill us. And so I, 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 ran, I ran with a child and, and I made it to a river. And and this time I determined to go the, the opposite direction. And so I ran into the water and it about took my breath away because it was very cold. I was shaking with adrenaline. I was holding the baby up like this. I realized her umbilical cord was hanging in the water. And I, I, I chided myself for it and I wrapped it around my neck. I held the baby, I would start, start to slip and I would pray for God to help me so that I could, I, I could keep her above the water. I don't know how long we were in the water. I was actually up to my chest at, at some points and I, I was on the verge of fainting because of the cold and the adrenaline. I walked over to the side of the river and there was a clump of something I sat on and I was still in the water. And I was crying out to God. And I was holding the baby like this. She was so small. And I remember just resting my head ever so gently on the edge of her beautiful little stomach. And I was just praying, God, God, help me. And when I was done, I realized she had stopped breathing. and She was dead. And I panicked. And I was, I, I, I was crying, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Help me. I started breathing into her mouth and nose. I held her close and I was rubbing her, trying to get her warm again. And I grabbed a branch and I pulled us up and out of the water. And there was a few trees kind of in a circle. And we went inside the trees and I laid on the dirt once again. And I coiled her umbilical cord on her stomach and I wrapped myself around her like a cocoon, trying to keep her safe trying to keep her warm. I knew she was dead, but I was going to protect her body and defend it with my life if I had to. And I ended up passing out. I woke up to angry shouts and I could see flashlights in the distance. And they found us and they started beating me and pulling out chunks of hair and burning it. Everything, everything was always burned. And they would beat and kick me in areas that didn't show all along my back on my leg and my stomach. And they took, took the child from me. 
Um, eventually, I, I was thrown in the back of a car, and at 3.30 in the morning, they would slow down and literally push me out the door. And my dad um, knew I was being taken. He had threatened me over and over again. He said, if your sisters or your mother ever find you sneaking back into the house, I will kill you. And he had told my sisters and my mom that I sleepwalked, which I didn't. I believe that was just a cover to um, protect him. So I, I developed the art of being able to move without being heard. I would take up to two hours to literally open a door, shut it, and move across one room. And then I would have to get rags, clean up my blood, and clean up any mud. And then I would have to take them to a wash basin, wash them out so there was no sign of, of them, and put them, put them in the washing machine. And then I would have to go to bed. I would wake up the next morning. My fingernails would be broken. I'd be caked in blood, covered in blood and bruises. and, and and I would be hurting with no idea why. But I, I would wake up and I would know that there was something I was protecting and it was so important I had to find it. And I'd pull all the blankets off of my bed and it was gone. And I couldn't, couldn't understand what it was. But as, the, um, as, as these nightly rendezvous went on, I... Um, I remember taking as many as four children. If there was a child that they had picked to kill, they would often cut off the child's hair and kind of into a butch haircut. It would be shorn. That was a sign of humiliation and a sign of sacrifice. And so um, I remember grabbing as many children as I could and running pushing them up in, in trees, pushing them through other areas, telling them to um, hide. And I, ha I had prayed for a long time that those children got away. But uh, it was um, at that point that they decided to sacrifice me because um, I was interfering with their plans, and um, I was not doing what they wanted me to do. So, so what happened when they decided to try and sacrifice you? Well, um, I had. I had seen sacrifices many times. Um, many times they would bring in a child about my age. They would even tell me the child was my twin or my sister. And they would allow us to play together and develop a bond. And we would swear to each other we would never let each other get hurt. And they would always end up killing them. When when they were going to sacrifice me, I was about, I think maybe nine. And they had stripped me naked and they had laid me out on the dirt and they had spread my arms and legs apart, wrapped ropes around them and staked them into the ground so that I couldn't move. I had seen this before and they would always take their time. They would do many, many cuts all over the person um, at first in order to cause them as much pain as possible before they were actually killed. They had, had actually placed me uh, next to a burning fire. And as I was laying there, I remember this, this is one of the first times I really started calling on God. I knew what was going to happen. They actually stood over me with a sacrificial dagger. And I remember saying, help me, Jesus. The second the word Jesus came out of my mouth, 
the fire not only went out, but it went cold. I, I was next to it. They had actually summoned Satan as a great dragon. And this huge black dragon, I saw it with my own eyes, this enormous black dragon flew out of the sky, landed on the other side of the fire. He had three red pupils in each eye. The people around the fire, they would have these staffs and they would start beating out a drum beat. And the drum beat would call Satan. I believe Satan was going to consume me after I was killed. When I said, help me Jesus, and the fire went cold, instantly in the distance there were headlights. Well, we were in the middle of the forest and it's not like there were roads there. So then it was mass pandemonium. I was cut loose, everything was grabbed. They literally picked me up and threw me on the floor in the back of the car on top of the shovel and the pick that they were gonna bury my body with. I was laying naked on top of the shovel and the pick. They uh, drove out of there as fast as they could. They, they uh, drove to my parents' house. They didn't even stop the car. They slowed it down, rolled me out, I was naked in the middle of the night. I rolled over to the ditch where I passed out. I woke up at some time later and I literally had to crawl across the gravel up the driveway to my parents' house and let myself in without being heard, cleaning up any mess as I went. Wow. Folks, uh, as I said, Sharice has incredibly acute recollection of the things that she's been through. And, and this is what I want to pause and comment on just for a minute here. I just got to get on my soapbox. It's time that the body of Christ stopped being such cowards. How many people I've met personally that would say, I don't want to know that. I don't want to hear that. I don't believe that. Cowardice. This is the kind of stuff that Jesus has his finger on because there are people all over the world that need his healing touch. But God called us his hands. And until the body of Christ gets the fact that we are part of God's solution set and stop relegating those that are overcoming this background to the pharmaceutical and the, the psychiatric realm, we are not going to see the shift that God wants to bring to this world. There's a reason why uh, I absolutely sold on the ministry to survivors of every kind of abuse. It's because that's where God's heart is beating. And so um, moving forward, Therese, you know, it is just extraordinary to see how Jesus delivered you. I mean, in the midst of such impossible circumstances, now you're here sitting and talking to me. But before we end this, you know, there was another incident uh, where they were trying to put you on the altar of sacrifice and which you just shared, I never heard you say to me before, but there was another time uh, where they put you in a labyrinth of sorts and um, God made a way of escape again. And um, I just want to let you talk about that circumstance as well, um, as it also involved you trying to save some children Okay, which, which labyrinth are you specifically referring to? Where 
the Satanist transformed himself and chased you to a door. Oh, 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 yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, they would. Um, they they would often do uh, what is called hunting games, which I know is real big with Dick Cheney and his estate, but they they would often take us children to to a very secluded forest. It, it was a private estate and there was a large fence around this um, forest and they would strip all of us children naked and they would tell us to run for our lives. And if we were caught, they were going to kill us. If you didn't do what they said, which many times I didn't, they would shoot a child right in front of you and kill it. And they would say, that is your fault. That's what's going to happen if you don't do what we say. At, at, at this one uh, memory, I was, I was older because I was, I was about 16 or 17, and they would line us all up, and they would tell us to run. And I ran for my life, and I was hiding in a clump of bushes. When I saw this um, little five-year-old girl and little three-year-old boy, a little brother and sister, run past me, the little boy was wearing bright red tennis shoes. But other than that, they were completely naked. I knew they would be caught because they were so little, they didn't know where to go. I, I jumped out of my hiding space. I um, grabbed the girl's hand. She had the boy's hand. And we just ran. We ended up running to the back of this property. There was a very large wooden fence there. I started looking at the bottom of the fence because there was a couple of areas where the wood, the wood was starting to rot away a little. I started kicking it with my foot. I actually broke several toes because I, I was barefoot. I kept kicking and kicking with my foot until I could break out a couple of the slats of wood. I dug as frantic as I could with my hands to make a little well in the, in the dirt. I grabbed the children and I shoved them under it. The wood actually cut into their backs as I was shoving them under. I got them both under and I peeked through a little crack in the wood and I could I could see their sweet little naked backsides running. And I told them, I said, don't stop running until you find help. And the last thing I remember was them running in those little, little tiny red shoes running. Well, the uh, colt was very angry at me. And this was another time that they were going to kill me again. And they took me into a series of tunnels underneath whatever estate I was, I was at. And these tunnels, they were very, very um, rough. They were hewn out of rock, out of, out of dirt. They were, they were small. And um, I was placed in one of these tunnels and in one of them was actually a big room. It was like a machine shop for automotive. I could, I could smell oil. I, if, if anyone believes in Bigfoot, let me tell you, he is real, but they are Satanist shapeshifters. Do not glorify Bigfoot because these are people that have turned into these evil beings and their one purpose is to kill and digest what they have killed. And um, these high level Satanists and cult members um, I've seen them turn into, into Bigfoots. I've seen men turn into women. I've seen them turn into snakes. In this case, they had unleashed a Bigfoot after me. I could smell him. I could see him down this hall. I was running down this hall. It was getting smaller and narrower. But at the end, I could see a wooden door. And I believe that that would have led me outside. I, I made it to the wooden door, but it was very thick. I was looking for, 
or any hinges on the inside so I could unhinge it and push it open, but the hinges were not on the inside. And I stood there and the Bigfoot was maybe 10 feet away from me. I called out to God. God, God hears when we call out to him, even in the midst of great evil. Instantly, as I called out to God, two angels appeared, and one of them swooped, and he picked me up like an infant. As he did that, this ball of fire hit that wooden door, and it shot out, and very peacefully and gently, we walked through that ball of fire, through the charts of wood flying every direction, and I, it was complete peace. And they took, took me out of there. At some time later, I woke up in my own bed the next morning. I was covered in blood. I was covered in scratches. I had broken toes. I, I, had, I had no memory at that point what had happened. But I just, I just want to give all the glory to God because I have died that I remember six times in my life that I have actually died where I was standing next to my body. And each, each, time, each time Jesus and my angels would be there and Jesus would say, you need to go back. Mm. I, was, I would look at my body even as a small child and I'd say, no, I don't, I don't want to go back. And he would say, I have a plan for you. It's going to be okay. You you need to go back. Six times I was I was revived and I was brought back. But I tell you, it it does take a toll on a person's body because the doctors had told me the entire front portion of my heart was not functioning. So it it does take a toll, but I am here and I I am strong and I I, I give God all, all of the glory, and I just, I just want to give hope to anyone else who is listening to the story, who has maybe gone through anything similar. And I just, I just want to tell you, I know the strength and the courage it takes just to survive, just to get up and make it through your day. And I, I just want to tell all the, all the survivors that I believe you, whatever your story is, I believe you, and I am very, very proud of you. And don't get up, don't give up, because God has a plan and a purpose for this. And he's the only one that can bring us through it. If it had not been for the Lord, I would have been one of those missing victims that was never found. I'm sure. Well, uh, Sharice, I believe you. And I am very proud of you for having the guts to come on this podcast, to open up the vault and to share so candidly, because this is not easy. And so folks, that is the program for today. Um, of course, there is more to Sharice's story and you can look forward to hearing some more from her in the future. But until next time, God bless and God speed. You've been listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like our video, and share this with friends. This podcast is a production of Bride Ministries International. Visit our website at brideministriesinternational.com to enjoy the Bride Ministries Church, the Bride Ministries Institute, free resources, and to support us financially.